Johnny Radio. You are listening to episode number 13. Now tonight is a very special episode because I've turned things over to the hardcover honey and left her in charge of finding tonight's guest. Now, I will explain who our guest is in just a moment, but first things first, we have to thank our sponsors. So big thank yous to Bean Nectar Meadery and Scandal Brewing for being with us on all of our podcasting adventures. And I get to introduce the hardcover honey, Jocelyn. Hi. <laughs> and our lovely guest honey, Lisa Fremont from HorrorWriters.net. Hello. Awesome. And then our very special guest is horror author Nick Cutter. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. We are delighted that you're here. So I'm going to turn things over to Jocelyn and Lisa, and I'm just going to be quiet over here in the corner. Have at it, ladies. Oh, oh my. This is a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, okay, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Nick, for taking the time to talk to us. And I want to tell you how much I really love the troupe. Um, I know you already know that, but for anyone listening that hasn't read it yet, I think it's hugely successful. It's scary, it's fun, it's cinematic, and I really basically wanted to call in sick and just read the whole thing in a day and a half. So, um, and Lisa, I know that you just finished it, so do you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah, I did. I was disappointed that I couldn't just sit down and finish it in a sitting but also what was kind of nice with uh, reading it over a few days is I think it made it more scary and more terrible every time my dog would lick me or something dirty happened. Um, <laughs> that's all I could think about was that book. And then I thought, oh, maybe we shouldn't read it. But then I'd had to. You know what I mean? Yes, I do know what you mean. Um, <laughs> Nick, have you had a lot of people tell you that it scared them? Um, yeah, I think I've had a few, uh, certainly a few people tell me it scared them, uh, you know, it, uh, certainly if more than a few people have said that it's, uh, it's disturbed them. I think it probably works on that register for a lot of readers too, um, kind of makes them feel icky and, uh, like they need a shower probably sort of a thing. That's a good description. That's a very good description. I was actually at the Boy Scout, uh, our local Boy Scout headquarters this week and I, really had to cover my mouth with my hand to keep from asking everyone I thought, have you read the truth? Have you read the truth? You guys should read the truth. I, I don't know that they would. Have you? Did you have to dance around the Boy Scout thing at all? I mean, I, I kind of noticed that it. there weren't a lot of specific references to that organization. It was more sort of vague. But, I mean, even though it was clear that it was supposed to be a Boy Scout troop. Yeah, I mean... I in the early process, I think I was trying to dance around a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and then I decided um, the sort of book that I wanted to write, uh, dancing around stuff was not going to be the way to go with this. So I sort of uh, threw the dance and shoes away and uh, didn't worry about uh, who I might, to be honest, insult or, or, or whose toes I might step on. Because I think if I worried about that too much, I, might, I probably wouldn't have written the book in the first place. So, I mean... I, <laughs> Your concern, sort of in an external sense, you you don't want to physically, you know, I mean, obviously hurt anyone's feelings, but um, but at the same point, you feel like okay, you're working in a fictional realm, so hopefully people are going to understand that uh, that everything is is couched in fiction. Well, not really, I'm kind of skipping ahead to one of my later questions on my list, but in terms of scouting. I know that I asked you this, and I, I don't know that you knew this, but scouts aren't allowed to be with an adult by themselves. And so that, to me, I mean, I bought everything in the book. I totally buy the premise. I buy the uh, dynamics. But that was the one thing that I thought, well, wait a second. Did, does the author know that scouts aren't allowed to be on a camp out with an adult <laughs> alone? or And has he just decided to ignore that? Or... Does he not know that? And, I, and that made me wonder how it would have changed the dynamic had there been another Scoutmaster along with uh, Tim. Yeah, um, to tell you the truth, Jocelyn, I did not know that. Uh, it totally, now that you say it, and certainly as a, as a, a new father myself, I re, I, it makes sense that you would, uh, you know, nowadays uh, or, or probably in the long history of the Scouting movement, there's always been at least a couple Scouts. And even when I was in Scouts, I remember now there was, you know, there was a, a senior leader and then there were, you know, extra leaders there. Um, so was, there was always that sort of oversight. So uh, I did not know that. But the truth of the matter is it probably would have made the story a lot more difficult to tell with, with an, potentially with an extra adult there. Because the more adults you add to the situation, the more that um, 
you, you know, to be honest, the more reasonable the situation would potentially have maintained itself and, and the less sure. the kids would have been sort of on their own devices to sort of figure things out, try to, try to sort themselves out of that horror on their own. And ultimately, um, this is a terrible thing to say, but, but the main scoutmaster was sort of, you know, you knew he had to go pretty early because it was really a story about <laughs> these, about these <laughs> kids trying to figure out things on their own, uh, you know, without any kind of adult uh, uh, oversight. Yeah, I was, um, I, I want to try to, I was, didn't know how spoilery we were going to get, so I'm glad you said that because I didn't want to say it, but you're right, obviously. Right. Um, good character, but the, the way that the kids related to each other and the fact that they were totally on their own, I know you've had a lot of kind of Lord of the Flies comparisons, but it reminded me more of um, any number of Stephen King books where, you know, the parents are kind of peripheral and the kids are sort of trying to fight against some force on their own. So that's what I loved about it. It made me feel like I was a kid again reading that stuff. And I think that's, yeah, that's hard but, to do. And, and Stephen King does that so well. I know it would be a, a good example of, you know, it takes place in a city, but, uh, or a small town of Derry, but you've got these, these kids who are really isolated from one reason or other from their parents. And they're sort of dealing with this, you know, fighting, fighting that sort of ancient evil on their own, partially because the parents either don't care or they don't believe in it. Um, and, and so, yeah, Stephen King is, is a huge touchstone for me, as he would be for, you know, writers of my generation and, and generations before and after. So um, it's very nice to hear you say that, because certainly, uh, uh, you know, he was that's, front that's of mind. That's the book that it reminded me of. Yeah. 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 Um, so in terms of appearance in your book, I, I loaned the book to a friend this week, and she loved it, of course. But she, So she emailed me today, and she said, I did kind of wonder as a parent what was going on with parents during this weekend. And so I've been instructed to ask you if you thought at all about giving the reader kind of a look at the parents and what, what was going through their minds, or if that just was something that you felt was unnecessary, they weren't part of the story, didn't need to be part of the story. Yeah, I think it, it probably is a matter of just of picking and choosing, really. Um, I think, you know, in some of sort of the, the interstitial, I guess, sections, we, we get a little bit about uh, um, flashbacks to or magazine articles, I guess, dealing with, say, Kent's father, the police chief. Uh, right. and maybe some dream sequences. You get a little bit, I feel like, of, of uh, say, uh, Max's father and Newton's mother. But you're right. They're very, very much peripheral characters. And I wanted to, I guess as much as I could, from, from what I've heard from a lot of reader feedback, is that um, they felt that the action on the island was where they felt the most centered, you know, and where they felt like the most engaged with the narrative. So, uh, so, so did I consider, uh, you know, in, involving some of the parents maybe in a more sort of, um, in a larger way in the narrative? I did, um, and I might have even in earlier drafts had had sections d dedicated more strongly to, to the parents, but they ended up not making it into the final cut of the book because I felt like the heart of the sort of of the narrative was on on that island with with those kids. That makes sense too. I, I think there was a scene where the some of the parents something with a boat where they, you know, you get the sense that the parents are trying to get to them, but it's just just a blip. And, and yeah, that's to... right. That's, there's sort of this peripheral element who is, um, and, and, you know, often the kids are, are sitting there really angry at their parents because they think that sure. they are being abandoned and, and they're left to this fate when, when ultimately I think uh, the interstitials let you know that the military really is, is stopping anybody from, from trespassing on this island because of the nature of the, you know, of the threat. I really love the interstitials, but I would imagine that there's some readers that found them maybe a distraction from the main story. So I'm curious about how you decided on that format. It was very, it kind of felt really Michael Crichton to me, which is a compliment. So, um, but I know that when you and I talked previously about possibly adapting it for the movies, that probably that part would be cut and it would just be the island. So how would you feel about that? Do you, are you married to the interstitial? lab reports and articles and such? Oh, in terms of, uh, yeah, in, in terms oh. of, of a movie adaptation, if that would, would ever happen. No, I think um, having gone through, uh, uh, having a movie made of one of my, uh, my first book, actually, a short story collection under my own name, um, I've, I've recognized very quickly that uh, you surrender, 
Yeah, well, you surrender everything, really. Once once you sign the option and, and once you uh, once you take the money, I would say it's a deal with the devil because hopefully you're you're handing it over to um, you know uh, a sort of a director or a producer or a screenwriter who is really interested in the material and wants to, I guess, retain as much of it as possible in, in the translation to, to film. But um, just the nature of of changing a book into a movie, uh, there are certain things that just can't come. So you're right. Uh, all the there might have there you know you might want to have some element of those interstitials retained just so mm -hmm. that viewers can understand uh, some of the some of the outside elements that are sort of forcing mm -hmm. the action on the island. But no, I think you'd want to keep it very much. A, a, I mean, it, from my perspective, I guess a perfect world scenario. You'd want to keep it a story of these characters, these boys on this island, um, and you know, make it a story of, of survival, really. Mm -hmm. Now, did you know from the beginning which of the boys was going to survive and which was not? Or did it kind of come to you organically while you were working your way through it? Uh, good question. Uh, I would say that, that, that I didn't know initially. Uh, I mean, knowing, knowing it was a horror book, I, I knew that, that some of them just weren't going to make it. Um, but, did, but the <laughs> specific ones, I wasn't. You know, what, what I really was working with in, in the book is that each of those characters um, is in a way a type, and in a way they also have, each of them has sort of a fatal flaw. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're maybe too much of a bully, uh, or they've got anger issues, or, you know, or they've got severe mental imbalances. Um, <laughs> and so you're trying to figure, and, 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 and sort of in the very rigorous, moralistic universe of horror, um, you can never get away with having a fatal flaw without it having some impact on your ultimate fate often. So, you know, once I recognized, okay, this boy has this kind of peculiarity of, of his personality and this boy has this one, that sort of put them on a certain trajectory towards either, either making it or, or not making it. So, so in a way the boys, you know, made made their own decision that way uh just just by by the way that that ultimately they they behaved uh going through the narrative that's an interesting way to phrase it but they made their own decisions so i love that that makes me happy um so i know that you mentioned that you were a boy scout and how long did you last in the scout god well i had very uh pushy parents so <laughs> i lasted <laughs> all the way i was a beaver um, I, I'm a Canadian, obviously, so I think there's some minor differences between Canadian and the American scouting system, but a beaver, a cub, a boy scout, and, uh, I forget, there were, there was a, a level after that, which, which I went into, and then finally I was able to throw off the parental yoke and say, no, forget it, I'm terrible, I don't want to do this anymore, <laughs> and they, uh, they said, well, you're almost ready to go to university, I guess we better forget it then, so, uh, yeah, so I had a very long <laughs> long and checkered uh, history with, with that movement. And that was part of my question of what did you like about being a scout and what did you hate about being a scout? Because I was, I mean, I guess I, w I was a little curious about how you had them. Um, I, I really liked the concept that they were on a, it was specific to scouting. They were on a scouting mm -hmm. getaway, so they had the scoutmaster who said you can't bring your cell phones, which of course opens a whole new avenue of story, which is great. Um, but they could have easily just been kids on a camp out with, with, let's say, one of the dads, so I was interested at your choice to make them Boy Scouts, and what your, how closely that mirrored any of your experiences, and parasitic worms notwithstanding, I'm sure that wouldn't okay. happen, but um, just sort of the interpersonal dynamics of the, the boys in the troop. Yeah, I think, I think Scouts had a very, you know, because I think my generation would have been one of the last generations where you know, scouting was a thing. I think I allude to that a little bit in, in the book and in, in that scouting as a movement, I think, is becoming a lot less popular than it, than it was. But but in my generation, it was still... But it was also sort of a punishment. It was something that parents, you know, sent you to that you sort of had to go, oh, I got to go to scouts. Oh, God, I got to go to this gymnasium and I got to put on my silly sash and, uh, you know, um, get these silly badges uh, for needlework or whatever. Um, I'm going to you know, jump in and, and commiserate with you on that one. What's that? I'm going to commiserate <laughs> with you on this. I went through the entire guiding program, so I know exactly yeah. how you feel. So exactly, <laughs> it's the exact same gender difference, but I mean, it's uh, you know, it's the same sort of progression that we both would have had to have gone through. So, um, 
so did I, I mean, did I hate it? I, I guess I didn't hate it. I, I just, I felt like it, my parents were very over scheduling of me, you know, it was like, you had your after school programs, and then you had your program to go after school to that. So scouting was just another thing that that you had to do. But that said, I mean, did I like the outdoors? Did I like the fact that I got a Swiss Army knife at some point? Um, <laughs> did I like the idea that we could we could go camping and do one match fires? And you know, were, were there were there some benefits to it? But I, I guess we all felt though. All me and my fellow f- scouters all felt that we were sort of in this jail together you know this scouting jail that we all had to go to and we'd show up at the meetings oh hey dude yeah what's going on so you know i liked it uh but i but i probably hated it at the same time um but but i certainly have a lot of memories from scouting and i think as a writer uh that was what was important primarily good ones primarily good ones i mean primarily Enough good ones that uh, that that, that uh, when when I talked about some of the stuff in the troop, I mean, I was talking about that from memory, uh, and and certainly some of the dynamics between between boys. I think that's what I enjoyed most of all about writing it was going back to that time in my life where, um, you know, where you're understanding that the world is a pretty weird place, uh, but you still don't have a huge amount of responsibility within it. You can still be a kid. But I yeah, guess that in, last, in, that in, last in, moment. That's right. That that last moment before you have to take on these adult responsibilities. But a situation like the troop would force you to take on these responsibilities really early, and and to really understand that the adult world is a very um, cruel place in in a, in a way. Yeah, for me, that was the part that stuck with me the most. Was um, I don't I mean although it was scary and gory and fun, it kind of broke my heart too when he was talking about how parents. You know, they just worry about different things. They worry about their mortgage and their, what kind of car they drive. And they're, they're not thinking about the stuff that the kids are thinking about. And that just rang so true to me as a parent. Um, so that was, a, that was just amazing, I thought. I really thought you captured being a kid. And I know we talked a little bit about it. And I will say that the one thing, um, I love Stephen King. And I know you love Stephen King, too. Mm. And it is a great book. Um, but... I I did kind of enjoy the fact that in in every Stephen King book, usually if there's a group of kids, there'll always be a girl who serves as a catalyst for maybe two of the boys have crushes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was refreshing that your your characters, I mean, there might be other women that feel differently, but for me, it was refreshing to not have some sort of mixed, you know, co-ed camping trip because it just adds a whole other layer. And I liked not having that as a distraction. I liked just the boys working with each other and against each other. So, um, and then do you want to talk any about that or was that not part of your sure. No, no, process? sure. That's, uh, that's, I'm glad you felt that way because that certainly wouldn't be um, every reader's sentiment. I think um, for me, the, the truth of the matter is uh, uh, writing under my, you know, as, as, as my real name, um, I've always sort of had male-driven narratives, and um, and and my most recent book under my own name had a had a very prominent female character, you know. But you, you, I think that there's a certain sense where you want to make sure you you know what you're you're doing really, and you want to make sure that you, you know, to write really strong, compelling characters is one thing, and I and I want to make sure that if I do do a, say a female character, uh, I want to make sure that that I'm doing her justice you know what I mean and so there's a certain sense of like I I did order the world of the troop to play to what my perceived strengths are which is like boyhood camaraderie um Mm -hmm. so so the fact that there there is no female character there I mean unfortunately was a bit of a strategic thing because as as obviously I'm I'm married and you know I I love women but you want to make sure that you are (laughs) are saying you, you want to make sure that you really understand that mindset and I think uh, I can certainly approach like sort of a, a female um, an adult female character and I've been, been you know have great to work with some um, female editors lately and we've we've worked through these characters and it's you know I'm, I'm getting better at it but I felt like an adolescent um, female character might have been something that I was not going to be able to handle properly um, mm-hmm. and so in order, in so, so in that way, you sort of set it up so that, well, um, you know, it's okay that there there's not a necessarily a, a direct female presence on this island. Although <laughs> we were out on a little tour here in Canada, and uh, my publicist said that she was actually one of the first 
female scouters in here in Canada, actually, because she said, you know what? I mean, I don't want to be in guides. I want to go and do whatever these things that uh, my brothers and scouts do. So, so it wouldn't have been weird at all to have put uh, a, a female character in, in that scouting movement. Uh, I didn't, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been odd at all to do so. So, yeah. Well, I, I, Stephen King, I think, does a great job at writing kids, which is something we talked about earlier. I do think that he, he's clearly better at writing male kids than female kids. That's my opinion. Uh, I'm sure other you, people Okay, yeah. That, that's interesting, because I remember Bev especially from Beverly, from, from It, and I, from my perspective, I thought he did a pretty good job with that. But maybe again, that's that's maybe a blind spot that I have that that uh, I'm I'm not seeing it properly. Well, and I, I've been a teenage girl, so I might have a little bit of an edge right, there. But I'm not saying I don't. I think he does a great job with his female characters. I just think his adult female characters are a little stronger than his adolescent female characters. Yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense to me. So your book cover um, is. Incredibly striking and features a very prominent uh, blurb from Stephen King, which I think has got to be like a gold seal if you're trying to sell a horror book. So can you talk a little bit about how that came about and how you think authors help position uh, other authors' works for certain audiences? Sure, sure. Um, You know, to be honest, Jocelyn, it came totally out of the blue. Um, Sometimes you know that, you know, your agent or your editor will tell you, well, we've you know we've sent the book out to X Y Z, and we we may hear back from from them, or we may not. In this case, um, you know the the people that they'd mentioned that they were sending it out to, uh, Stephen King was not on the radar at all because he's not. I'm not really sure how you get a book to Stephen King, to be honest. Um, right. But it turns out there's a a press called Cemetery Dance who does a lot of limited edition uh, books, uh, sort of a smaller press, but really well respected, and the. Guy who runs that press named Rich Chismar, and he has a direct line really to to Stephen King because they produce a lot of his limited edition works. So he read, I don't know, got his hands on a copy of the Troop in 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 the Ark stage, and read it and liked it and thought, you know, I don't know, Stephen King might like this. So he sent it to him of his own free will, basically. And I guess uh, Mr. King read it and uh, contacted my agent and said, "Here's a quote." Uh, That's and great. Was, you must have been so yeah. happy. Oh, I was blown away. Right? I was totally blown away. I was sitting on the couch here, and uh, my uh, my fiance was was sitting on on the other couch, and uh, you know it pops up the little you know red numeral one new message, and I open it up. I was like, holy, holy shit! Uh, I can't believe it. This is this real this guy. I mean, I can't believe that you know because he is he's he's an idol. There's no there's no other way of saying it. He's certainly the the biggest influence on me as a writer ever. So the idea that uh, someone who is that big of an idol to me has read a word that I've ever written and beyond that had something nice to say about it is um, an immense pleasure. But he's just a really generous writer, so I'm, I'm not surprised he did it. I am surprised, but I'm not surprised because he, he likes to support writers um, you know, more than, more than a lot of writers do. He's very good at um, kind of steering people towards smaller works that maybe they wouldn't have found, not necessarily your book, but some of Usually he'll do something for Entertainment Weekly every year, his top ten books of the year, and I've read many of them, and they've been maybe something I wouldn't have known about otherwise that I've enjoyed. Uh, yeah. So aside from – oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying he's, yeah, totally, totally generous, and uh, um, and it costs him nothing to do it, and it, it engenders such goodwill, and, uh, you know, it just makes writers writers' lives in, in, a, in a weird way, you know, just having that kind of um, – not not that it sells another book, just because he's a guy that you grew up loving. So it means a lot just sure. from that level. Yeah. It's a validation, I'm sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's the only reason I read it, actually. <laughs> because I, don't, I, don't, I don't tend to read horror books very often, actually, because um, they get into my head. And it was an Entertainment Weekly. It was one of those little tiny side ads. And I saw the Stephen King blurb. And he's never steered me wrong. Otherwise, I don't know that this book would have ever been, I would have ever known about it at all. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably you and, uh, you know, 90% of the readership so far of the book, I'm sure. So that's, I mean, that's not, because, I mean, obviously I love this, and then now that makes me want to go find your other titles, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's the whole purpose of blurbs and and, and getting them and, uh, and, and sort of the fortunate good luck of it, too. I think certainly my publisher 
became a lot more, I think, excited about the book. Sure. Dr. King had something nice to say about it. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> I'm a huge believer in blurbs. I really think, you know, if you have an author that you love, like I love Dennis Lehane. So if Dennis Lehane blurbs the book and I pick it up at the library or at the bookstore, I am that much more likely to give it at least a try based on the fact that I know I like Dennis Lehane. So I think that certainly works. Don't you guys think so? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So aside from Stephen King, can you talk about some other authors that you particularly enjoy? Um, some, that, I mean, my long-term uh, writing loves, especially in horror, would be um, Clyde Barker, for sure. Um, I think we spoke earlier about uh, Robert R. McCammon being, you know, a huge, uh, really a titan, I think, of, of horror literature. Um, and and I, I'm not saying he doesn't get the love, because he certainly does, but I feel like he maybe doesn't get as much as he deserves. Um, no, he doesn't. Yeah, would you? Yeah, would you? I, I think we both agree on that. Um, yeah. I, just one-off books, like, uh, and ones that have freaked me out, uh, The Exorcist. Um, House of Leaves really freaked me out. Um, that's a tough thing to do, you know, is in our jaded days to find a movie or a book that really, really, you know, hits that fear center and really, really creeps you out. Uh, it's, it's so rare for me to get that. So when I do uh, come across a book like that, uh, I certainly catalog it and p- pass it on to other people who, whose tolerance sort of goes that way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it to someone who is not a real horror lover. I need to give House of Leaves another try. I think I tried back when it came out, and I couldn't get into it. But I love the – have you listened to the Associated CD? No. Okay, well, the guy that wrote House of Leaves, Mark Danielewski, Danielewski, mm-hmm. I don't know. But anyway, his sister is Poe. Does anyone remember Poe? Yeah. Anyway, she's got, a, she's got a great CD called Haunted that is sort of a companion piece to House of Leaves. And, I mean, I've worn that thing out. It's amazing. So I probably – I'm going to try again. I'm going to try again with House of Leaves. That'll be good. House That'll of Leaves a is, is, I can see how a lot of people, and I, even my, my myself, I think I struggled to get into it. Uh, it's one of those books that once you pass a certain threshold with it, I think you really, you really get into it and, and suddenly it, it gets its hooks into you and then you, you won't get, you won't get spat out of it. But, but to sort of pass that initial threshold and get into it. Um, can be a bit daunting. I know I felt the same way, but once it once it had its hook sunk into me, I, I've never quite been as unsettled as as that book has made me. Okay, I'm going to do that again, but I'm not going to do it when my husband and son are on a scouting weekend because that seems like a bad <laughs> idea. Um, so, oh, what was my next question? Was it about scouting? Oh, books. Now, so authors that you love, he talked about a little bit about that, but are there any authors? Well, I'm, I guess this isn't really a fair question because I don't want you to feel like you have to trash anybody. But are there any authors that you think are just ridiculously popular that you just cannot understand the appeal at all? Oh God, that's uh, that is. I'm just you probably not a not a politically correct question. Here. Well, there, there probably are. I mean, it's okay. If you, I, I've always felt that if you if you trash writers who are so big that it doesn't matter if you trash them. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, well, my mm-hmm. my opinion of them makes no, you know, like, what was it? I mean, this is, this is an easy trash, but I know my, my fiance read a book by, we didn't buy him. It was by James Patterson, but he's <laughs> you know, writing like romances now and he's co-writing <laughs> thing with all sorts of people. I don't, I don't really, he's more of a factory now, I think, than he is, than he is a writer. Um, right. So, so like that, you know, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I think his passion as as a writer is probably gone. And I bet you, if you found him on the street and you said you're you're pretty much sold dead as a writer, aren't you? He'd probably go, Yeah, I, I am. Uh, <laughs> so, so you know, uh, I mean, I think his priorities are just different. But but in general, I find writing is, I mean, it's such a tough gig. You know, I, I think that's what I what's that's what I find with with uh, the the reviewing and and having to sort of sit there and. And, 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 you know, just it, absorb these other people's opinions about your work, good or bad. Um, mm-hmm. So it's sort of like one of these things where you've got this whip dog syndrome yourself. So you can't really take the lash out and whap somebody else around. So uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. especially, you know, writers in, in my position who are, you know, every book is a, is a treasure and, and every new contract is something to be really like deeply happy about. So um 
so yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I can't really go uh, kick anybody else into the weeds. Although there, there, there certainly are some writers out there who, whose stuff doesn't appeal to me, but that's, that's fine. <laughs> that was a very, very diplomatic answer. That was great. <laughs> um, so, and I know that, so the script was written under your uh, pseudonym. I know Nick Cutter is not your actual name, and I'm curious about how that changes your process at all, writing under, and I know that you have some other pseudonyms, so I'm going to go get some of those as well, but how... How do you decide who you're writing as, and how does that change anything about your your voice or your process? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, the truth of the matter is, this whole Nick Cutter thing came to be because uh, my agent really felt that. Uh, I mean, to be dead honest, I think agents and pub the publishing industry doesn't really give readers a lot of credit. Sometimes uh, they think that, well you know, so-and-so writer does this work in this stream, and, and readers aren't really going to understand if he or she goes and starts writing in this stream, uh, which I'm not really a believer in, but he thought, my agent thought that, listen, you sort of do these things on the, on the so, so-called literary side of it, and this, this thing is well a departure, pure horror, so why don't we just set up a, why don't we just set up a fake name for you, and you can publish it under that. Um, and I guess the problem there is that I've got a lot of friends here in Toronto who are in the genre and, uh, and, you know, they said to me, well, I mean, are you embarrassed or shamed or, you know, and the truth of the matter is I couldn't be more, uh, proud of the work that I've done as Nick Cutter. It's really purely a business decision more than it was a personal decision. Um, and I, and, and to answer your question about, you know, uh, you know, a different frame of mind. I, I don't I take a different frame of mind into it. I put the same amount of effort and, and hard work and dedication into the stuff that I've done as Nick Cutter as the stuff I've done under my, uh, under my own name. That's a good answer. So circling back, <laughs> I'm very good. You've done this before. I have a feeling no. um, w- with regard to the truth. I, 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 and I know Lisa, we talked about this a little bit offline today. There was a lot of kind of a lot of animal violence. So mm. can you talk a little bit about that? And sure. is there some reason that you decided to put so much of it in the book? And do you have any pets? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got my, my cat here. Uh, it's actually my, my fiance brought them into the relationship, but we've got two cats and one here is curled off my legs as I'm, as I'm speaking to you. And, uh, we grew up with, with dogs and, uh, and, um, hamsters and every, every imaginable kind of animal, uh, when, when we grew up and, um, you know, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, and I think when it comes to me writing horror, um, I go for the things that terrify me the most and disturb me and bother me the most. And the, the, I guess the hope uh, is is that those things are are things that that, that unsettle other people, and um, I knew I I used to go to school. I went to school down in Iowa for a couple of years. Um, I did a, a master's degree down there, and I would come home late from the bar sometimes. And at three o'clock in the morning, PETA used to buy ad space, you know, and they used to show these mm-hmm. sort of videos of, I mean, stuff that you I do not believe you can see in Canada. So I was quite a virgin when I was seeing some of these things, um, uh, you know, footage of stuff done shot at labs, you know, under a sort of undercover footage or, or things that people had captured, uh, you know, at fur farms. And I mean, that stuff like wrecked me. I mean, it wrecked my <laughs> soul. Uh, and, and you couldn't pay me enough to actually watch it again now, knowing what I'd be seeing, um, some of these things. Um, and so I guess my feeling just in, in fiction, people, I guess writers have two choices. You can either present a view of the world that is like safe and makes people feel good and they can close the book at the end and be like, ah, okay, my life is pretty rough, but this, this was a nice little departure and it was a nice sunny little valley that I was able to lie in fictionally for a while and then I feel better about myself and better about the world. Or you can look at the world in such ways like this is, these are the colors of the world, you know? The, these are things that I have seen. These these are the ways that that we have treated the most innocent creatures amongst us, um, and you can look at that because because that's a, a true painting and the true colors of the world as I see it. So when I saw those videos, and I used to work at a place called Marineland, which is like a a Sea World 
version in Niagara Falls, and I saw some atrocious things there too. So I've seen some really cruel things perpetrated by human beings to animals, and it has scarred me. Um, and, and I guess I feel that that's where the real horror lies sometimes in this world, and what is my truest sense of what horror is? It's some of those things that I've seen and, and some of those things that I, I recognize exist in the world and the cruelty that we do to animals. Um, so that's kind of where that came from. Um, and, uh, and it might be too much for some people, and I guess I apologize in a, in a sort of diffuse way for that. But, you know, when I'm looking for what real horror is, that's what I feel real horror is, and, and that's sort of what I try to transpose onto the page. How were you able well, to do that, though? To write, to write, the turtle, I'm sorry, the turtle was like a cannibal holocaust mm. revisit for me, like PTSD. So I just was curious how you, how you did that, like how you were able to go inside yourself and write that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, you just, you, unfortunately, you go back to the things that you've, you've seen, um, and I really just, I mean, I, again, I grew up in a, a sort of a, a an adjacent uh, to a country area. So, I mean, I uh, saw my friends uh, worked at ranches or they, they worked on family farms. And the things that some people feel to be like just just the price of doing business or the idea that an animal is, uh, is sort of like a tractor. Like you just use it until the tractor stops working and then you just get another tractor. Um, you know, so so I guess that's that's it. Uh, it. It's it's a matter of having seen things, and a matter a matter of having intuited the ways that we really can just be cruel to animals. And I think that scene with the turtle, especially, that's sort of a sort of a different thing too. That's two boys who are incredibly scared, um, incredibly hungry, um, have been put in a situation where they're they're absolutely terrified. And they just don't act the way they should. They act in no, a way yeah. that shames them, obviously, in the, the way, a way that they're deeply regretful for afterwards. And I guess in the moral universe of, of, of the troop, um, the fact that they, that they saved the turtles' babies afterwards is, is kind of a small, um, I don't know, a way to recompensate for the, the awfulness that they did. So I know a lot of people talk about that scene, and it certainly was not an easy scene to write. I wasn't doing cartwheels and backflips and going, oh, look, this is, this is the best, most fun thing I've ever done. Um, but I guess that's the point of a horror book, too, sometimes. I mean, at least a certain specific type of horror is that it's, it's meant to make people feel a certain way. Um, and and maybe, maybe it's a way of a writer confronting certain things about the world that, that I live in that, that scare me you know, to death and knowing that I have a son too. And that, uh, um, you know, I don't know, there, there, there's certainly a lot of things going on and, and some of it's sort of like alchemy that goes on outside of my head and I can't really give you a good explanation, but that's as, that's as good as I can get without, you know, getting deep into the twitching neuroses that rule my life. <laughs> that, scene, that scene didn't scare me. It did make me sad, but the, the, um, the kitten stuff, uh, definitely. Oh God! Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Oh, Shelly. Shelly. Yeah, Shelly. He's a work. The turtle scene was Shelley. really heartbreaking, though. I mean, I I appreciated right. what everything you just said, and I and it was true. They did. They have. They felt remorse, and then when they realized the babies, and you know, my heart broke for them. It was just it. It yeah. It wasn't scary. It was just so unsettling. I guess. Yeah, Which is the point of the book, but it's just I I I I was telling Jocelyn earlier I had to actually skim through that to get to the end of it because it was just really really upsetting me. Yeah, no, I, I don't. So, really... Yeah, it's so it was just interesting to me that you would you know feel the same way about animal cruelty. I don't know. I don't know that I'm a big enough person to go inside myself and um, do that. That sounded like I was making you sound bad. I didn't mean that. <laughs> no, no. I think it's probably most horror. I mean, you know, I've you, you face it as a writer quite a bit because you're that's part of your job is to go in and uh, investigate your id at whatever remove you can, and then and then yeah, I mean, you throw it out, out on a page, and and other people have a you know have an opinion on it, and that and that's fair. Uh, and that's that's p part of my job too. So no, I'm 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 totally totally cool with that. And uh, um, and you know when you're writing scenes like that, you know that there's going to be a reaction, and it's not going to necessarily be be pleasant, and that people are all going to be 
pleased with what you've done. Yeah. We we have uh, one of our horror honeys, Lenny. She she can watch any slasher movie known to man, but if there's like a dog gets poked with a stick, she can't take it. She cannot take the animal cruelty. So it's kind of interesting the different stuff that affects people. Yeah, I, I don't those triggers. I can watch. I mean, not that I want to watch some animal torture movie, but that doesn't bother me much. But I used to be completely hard hearted and cynical and jaded, and then since I had my son, although he's eight now, so I'm starting to get jaded again, but now all the kids in Jeopardy stuff, that kind of sets me off, which I assume is sort of what you're probably experiencing, is it? Because your, your son's little, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing how, especially I find with horror, more than anything I've ever done, is that your current concerns uh, really infest your, like the book that I just finished now is deals with a, a father, really, who is you know, you know, he's lost his son somehow. Um, and, and, and that, uh, would be a concern that I would not have been able to write convincingly about, I don't think, uh, before I had my own son, but now I feel like, well, it's all I think about. I mean, Mm -hmm. I want to go outside. I do, why do I, why do that? The outside's full of crazy people and buses running around, (laughs) you know, toxic air, just stay inside in the basement, like a couple of mushrooms and we don't go anywhere. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think, I think as you get older, um, especially with horror, uh, the things that scare you, um, change quite significantly. You'll still have those sort of primal fears that you've probably had since you've been a kid and, and those won't ever, ever change. Like I'm, I'm definitely afraid of, of sharks, but, um, but your, your other fears sort of mutate and change and, and take on the tenor of whatever the life you're currently living. I think uh, with the boys that being sort of preteen, 14 on, in the troop, that was interesting to me because their fears, I mean, I think a lot of what those kids think about is what other kids think of them. And I know you touched on that when you gave Newton sort of an alter ego um, on Facebook, which I found, uh, I found that whole section very interesting because first of all, I wasn't sure that something like that would work because I wasn't in a small town, which is what I felt they were in. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong mm-hmm. about that. And then I, I, thought it was sort of um, emblematic of how kids today are growing up. Everything's online, everything's social media, and how you felt about your new baby growing up in that kind of world and how my friends and I like to say that we wouldn't be a 13-year-old girl again in the Facebook, Instagram age for all the money in the world. So that was interesting to me that that you touched on that one because you didn't have to. It it, it didn't have to be part of the story, but you made it part of the story, and I kind of wondered about your feelings on that. Uh, that's a that's a great question. That that is something that that whole aspect sort of came in uh, during the editing phase. My my editor, when I first tendered the book, I think it was about I think it was about seventy five thousand words, which which probably would have printed page has been just just under three hundred pages, um, maybe even less, maybe like two hundred fifty pages. So it was a really like tight, just fireballing, plot heavy book. And my editor felt like, well, listen. Um, we need a little bit more out of these characters. Well, I think we need to understand them a little bit better. We need to have a bit of a better distinction between them. So the majority of, of the edit, uh, probably something like 20,000 words, was, was really just cha- you know, adding to these characters. And, and that whole aspect with Newton and, and the Facebook and making up that fake friend so that he could sort of express himself but under the guise of someone who was, he felt was cooler than himself or would be more accepted than himself was yeah w- was was totally added in the editing phase and was was done with an eye towards yeah uh, uh, t- I think towards uh, how kids my sense anyways of, of how kids uh, communicate at, at this point and you're right would it would, would it work in a small town I'm I'm really not certain you're right there has to be a certain suspension of disbelief but um, I just like the idea that Newt was definitely I think my favorite character. And that he would felt this need to, you know, that society or, or peer pressure made him have to, like, create this alter ego for himself when he's really just a sweet kid is sort of heartbreaking. He was. He was a sweet kid. He's, I mean, I really, he was a standout character for me. So, and it might be just because he was around for most of the book, but um, I really, Lisa, did you think so? Yeah, I was going to say earlier, I felt like Newt actually in his own way was kind of a female presence because he was the caretaker and he loved his mom. I loved when he started talking about his mom. 
<laughs> or when we went back and learned about it. And it just all was so, he, he was just the sweetest thing. And I, he, yeah, I could see how he would create, you know, another identity to be cool. Because yeah. he felt wasn't accepted yet. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really sad when he had his little lash out, you know, saying, I know what you guys think. And yeah, but he was just such a good boy. And I don't know. <laughs> I, I love the <laughs> Where it's all those things that are going to, as he gets older, you know, well, you know, as, as, a, as a child gets older, that there are, there are things that he or she will come to be respected for and loved for. But they just yeah. aren't things that people will love them for at that age. They're actually things that are weaknesses or things that they're going to get picked on for. Like just being a kind person, being, uh, you know, having that sort of sensibility and compassion. Uh, that's just like the worst thing to be as a kid. It's like you're, you're a wimp. You're, you know, yeah. But the other boys yeah, accepted it from him as well. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was interesting. They made fun of him for it, but when he didn't give them the care they wanted, they didn't like that either. Yeah, exactly. They, 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 yeah, I mean, I think boys that age, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure girls too are, I mean, are, they're your users. You're a little bit of a user. And, and I think that's one of the things that you learn as you get older is that you become more of a, a more of a, more of a giver. And, and Newton just was that at an earlier stage of his development than those other boys were. Yeah. Boys that age, I think it's all, on the, it's all, it's all pretty much out there though. Girls that age, it's all sneaky and underhanded and devious, which is, a different set of concerns, but boys, boys are well. Let's just say teenagers are mean to each other, right? That's a good generalization. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, <laughs> I think it's different. It's gender, as you guys have as I've said. It's it's different. I think boys are more likely just to roll around in the mud and punch each other, and then it's like, okay, we're good. Whereas I, I think I think girls have a have a I have a I have a different tactics. Anyways, it's more about isolation. I think and. Uh, yeah, well, I don't really know. That's why. That's why I had to be very careful. Uh, you know who I was going to have to book. Um, I felt like the ending of the troop. I'm not going to give anything away here, but it, to me, it was a little bit ambiguous. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about that, and if there was any possibility of a follow up book, and what something like that would look like, or is it just one of those sort of Truman Show endings where it's up to your own interpretation? Yeah, I'd say it's more, you know, I think some people really didn't like the ending as well. And I can, you know, mea culpa on that for sure. Um, you know, you didn't want the the equivalent of the, the hand coming up out of the cemetery grave and, you know, the end with a question mark on it. Um, <laughs> you didn't want that kind of an ending. But, uh, but at the same point, you sort of wanted... I, I sort of wanted an uneasiness, you know, I didn't, I didn't want a pat ending and I did what it really had ended up with. And this is, I can tell you guys this, this got cut, but it, the actual ending was of a, like an Italian news story uh, where they had found a whale washed up on the beach in Italy, but it was totally empty, skeletonized, just skin basically. Uh, That's what I was expecting. It had said something like, you know, you know, it, 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 this whale had, you know, probably had, had had a tracker and it was found somewhere initially in the oceans off of, you know, Canada and it somehow managed to swim all the way to Italy, but it was nothing but a skeleton by the time it got here. So, you know, the idea basically that like, da, da, da. But uh, my, yeah. my editor and agent <laughs> both thought, oh, that's a, that's a little corny. We're not, let's, let's not go with that. Ah, so, so we ended up interesting. I ended up going to something that is equally sort of um, dubious or, or sort of not really a, a no finality to it. Um, but in terms of a sequel, um, that's not certainly not front of mind. I, I guess uh, I, I can't think of any any scenario where I'd really want to go back and revisit those particular uh, villains again. I feel like I've sort of said my piece when it comes to uh, to tapeworms. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, never, never say never, uh, but it, it's certainly not, uh, no one's, no one's banging down my door asking for a sequel. And, uh, and right now I, I, I think I've, I have other, other horror ideas I'd probably like to investigate first. Well, that's good. I'm excited about your future stuff. But what if your agent said, you know what, Troop, it's doing amazing. You sold a billion copies. We've got to do it. We've got to do another tape on book. Everyone's waiting for another tape on book. Oh, yeah. Make it about, make it about the adults. 
just do same weekend, but here's what's happening on shore. Could you, could you pound that out? Or would you just say like, I really, I'm not inspired. I guess it would depend where I'm at and if my mortgage is paid off. I hate to say that. That sounds very <laughs> mercenary. But, no, uh, it doesn't at all. You're an adult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're adults and parents and, and there's certain, um, you know, exigencies of life that have to be accounted for. So, so I mean, if, if we're, all that were to happen, and if, and to be honest, if there was interest in it and, and if people were sort of like, ah, you know, bring, bring those slimy bastards back. I mean, yeah, oh, well, sure. I'm sure we could find other things for them to eat. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> we talked about, remember that, Kat, we talked about that a little bit when we had Ethan Embry on. One of my questions for him was, you know, I know you don't want to go back and revisit, like, your 90s movies, but right. what if someone said, hey, I'm going to give you $3 million, but you got to wear the stupid outfit from this stupid movie the whole time and just act like you're 15 again, would you do it? And he was like, uh, kind of, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I do have, I have bills to pay, and I'm, that's, you know, that's how the world works, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, as long as you could find some inroads into it, if, if Ethan could or if I could, that, um, you know, that makes it makes it fun. I mean, I think that's the main point about the troupe that that I, you know, I would come out of kind of come out of my you know writing room, and uh, and my my fiance would be like, you just look like you had a hell of a lot of good time today. Mm-hmm. As, you know, mm-hmm. whereas I I'd come out sometimes when I'm working on the more literary stuff, and she'd be like, you look like you've been in a coal mine all day. You look awful. You look hag. You you need to go. You know, have a stiff drink or something. And I don't know if Lisa would agree with me on this, but I, I feel like as a reader, you can tell when an author is having a great time. Like, I think Stephen King, a lot of his books, he feels like he's having fun. The truth to me felt like, it, I don't know that you wrote it quickly, it felt like you wrote it quickly, because it felt very organic and, you know, exciting. And then there are books, like, this sort of goes back to earlier when you are talking about James Patterson a little bit, where you can feel them, and, and this is the same with movies, you can feel people just phoning it in, and like, where do I sign this check? And I, I think there's a real difference as a reader. Um, and obviously, it's more fun when you think the author enjoyed what he's working on. Yeah, yeah. And, and you never know how it's going to go. You know, you, I think you set out with every book with the same hope and the same intensity. But sometimes you just sort of get sucked into a really wonderful slipstream and, and uh, you have these enormous days where, you know, you're excited to go into it and you come out of it even more excited and that just persists throughout the entire writing. And, and, you know, that's not, every book does not go that way. But, uh, but when you're fortunate enough to get sort of pulled into one that way, then you, you just sort of give yourself over to the current and, and enjoy it. And, and, and the troop certainly was that way. And it's, I know it's not going to be every book that way, but, uh, it's nice when something happens and you can just enjoy it. Have you, how long did it take you to write? Oh, I'm almost embarrassed to say it probably took me six weeks. Oh my gosh. Yeah, That's yeah, neat. I know. That, for That's first, fast. Tra- isn't that fast? That seems really fast. It was no for for me. I, a book usually takes you know, uh, you know, can take take a year, which is still not that long compared. We, I mean, yeah, there are some writers who'll take ten years to write a book. Um, uh, so so six weeks was almost. I felt like, well, this can't be really good. I didn't I didn't work hard enough on it. But the truth <laughs> of the matter is, I worked hard, and it just sort of came out. Um, really quickly, and, and I think that momentum is sort of in, in the book there, in the DNA. No, I think that's great. Kat, just for the record, that's not me ruffling. <laughs> it's, it's me. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sitting perfectly still. I'm like a statue. Um, Lisa, did you have questions that we didn't cover? Um... <laughs> Yes, I had two questions. I apologize for the ruffling. I was trying to... Trying to I wasn't going to let her throw me under the bus for the ruffling. Like the <laughs> um, yeah, no, I had a question. I had two questions. One about Shelly and one about where did you get this idea specifically? Because I'm really surprised that this diet pill does not exist and is not being sold on Twitter right this moment. I know, I want some. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Because I mean, they do. It is true that in Mexico you can go get a tapeworm. I mean, let's. I. (laughs) I dare you to find me a woman who would never, on you know, one dark day go. Wait a minute. All I have to do is swallow this, and then I'm thin. Right. It's the best pet ever. It goes where you go, eats what you eat. 
and then it just sure. leaves when and then I take this pill and you're like goodbye. I mean, that is so magical. Where on earth did you think of this? Um, yeah, I, I did do that research about the, about the Mexican. Uh, I guess that you just you just eat tainted meat basically, and you eat enough of it, you'll eventually get a tapeworm, and uh, the pounds will melt right off. But um, I was I, there's there's um, a museum here in my hometown, and they had they had um, an exhibit called Water. So basically how we use it as a species, the sort of everything that's in water. And there was a small little video set up just on a loop uh, in this darkened sort of room off to the side. And I went in there and I watched it and it was about tapeworms. And really under close magnification, tapeworms are really, really fascinating things to look at. So um, I was entranced. And that was, that was enough right there to say, hey, i got to write a book about a bunch of scouts getting noshed on by these things. Yeah, not not uh, <laughs> but tapeworms are fascinating. I have had the pleasure of taking a parasitology class where I actually had like dog feces with you know worms in them. Ooh. So I think that's where I got. I think that's why your book. I was like, oh my god, like I've actually seen these things. <laughs> and at the same time, at the same time, especially specifically, you know, in North America, we're so lazy. I could see how somebody would go, oh, but if I eat that, you know, diet. So I just was, I just, I was just really interested as what on earth you would come across that would make you think that. But they are fascinating with their little sections and the weird mouths and everything. Yeah, completely yeah. sexual. They just sort of... I don't know, just keep keep sort of sectioning themselves off and creating new bits of themselves and going on. They're 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 revolting. Yeah. Yeah, revolting, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well and the the worms specifically in the troop, what it, what interested me about that was that they didn't seem benign. I mean, they seemed really like a malevolent thinking entity. Yeah. So I don't I don't know how I mean, I'm guessing that's not what you would have studied in class, so that's more that was a specific plot choice um but that that was interesting to me that it wasn't like it wasn't just enough that they had this ridiculously supercharged tapeworm it had to be like almost a scheming tapeworm right Right. yeah yeah i think they sort of (laughs) they sort of diversified as the book went on they became more and more sort of uh you know yeah you're right like thinking and malevolent and and trying to fire off and get the kids even when they weren't inside a body so (laughs) Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were—they are super hypercharged, revolting little bastards. <laughs> and there you go. That's your tagline. The yeah, there, exactly. Supercharged, hyperactive, revolting little bastards. <laughs> I like it. That's the new logline. Um, I think. I mean, we went through all my questions. Is there, Lisa? Do you have any other questions? Or Kat, do you have any questions for Nick? I was curious where Shelley came from. Oh, Shelly. I, I guess Shelly just belongs to a long line of, um, you know, psychopath characters. But Like, Shelly exists because I think you needed somebody, the book needed somebody to push the action in, increasingly dire. And, um, like, any time the kids might have been able to figure it out on their own, they needed sort of that agent of chaos who kept wrecking things. Because he wanted things to stay wrecked. He wanted... He wanted to basically turn the island into his own little playground and, and get to do the things that he never could do, um, you know, at home. So, so Shelley, you know, in a way is, is, was a tool, a narrative tool, uh, I think a very creepy narrative tool to get, to get the action going in the direction that it needed to be going to, you know, get, get the grand outcomes that I was looking for in the book. It was just interesting that the boys, I think, had always identified him as being not a hundred percent, but they still... Mm-hmm. He was still always included on their scout trips all the time. So that was, I don't know, that was interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, even when I was in scouts, there were there were kids that, you know, their parents just like, well, go, you know, go to scouts. And it was sort of expected that that's sort of one of the doctrines of scouting that, you know, everyone do it together. Everyone just, everyone ruck in together. Everybody, you know, all for one sort of a thing. So if there's, if there's ever a place that a kid like Shelly could probably hide out and be accepted, it'd be, it'd be scouts. Oh, okay. Ooh, that's creepy. That's super yeah. creepy. That that's funny that you say that, Lisa, because my friend that I loaned the book to, that was exactly her question. She said the part with Shelly towards the end, you know, she, she was curious about the added bit of drama that having that kid along brought to the story because it seemed like they had enough working against them. But you're right. I guess it was kind of a push-pull 
um, situation. She also said that at the end in the cave, she kept thinking about the fly, the Jeff Goldblum version of the fly. So I thought that was pretty funny because it was certainly mm. scripted. Yeah. I think um, we're good. Is there anything else anybody wants to? I mean, Kat, do you need to do your? I will. I will swoop outro? in. I will swoop in. Um, okay, so Nick, thank you so much for joining us. This is super entertaining. I haven't read the book, but now I totally want to. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, so, we didn't ruin anything. We didn't spoil it for you, though, did we? Oh God, no, no, no. I'm okay, excited. You're gonna love it. Tape worms, and I'm down. Oh, you know what? I did have one more question. Is there an audio book of the truth yet? And if so, it is who. Oh, I guess we did talk about this on Twitter. You, there is an audio book, right? Yeah, there is one. Yep, there is. Uh, apparently, it's pretty good. I, I haven't listened to it yet, but um, I've, I've had uh, people get in touch and say they really have enjoyed the... His name's Corey Brill, who did it, and they say he did a really great job. I, I think I'm going to order that, because I, my husband's not a reader, which blows my mind, as I'm sure it blows everyone's on this call, but he will listen to an <laughs> audio book, and so I, I like to get him... Jocelyn, my and husband's he not loves a this kind of... It's crazy. How can it's it not weird. be? Like, no, what I was reading this book, I don't get it. Like, this is your favorite book. You need to read this book. So now that you said that, there we have two audiobooks for non-readers. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. It's a sneaky way. And I'd also like to go on record as saying that I kind of object when people say, I'm reading such and such, and what they really mean is I'm listening to such and such, because I think it's a completely <laughs> different experience. And I, I, I'm almost like... I don't know, Nick, maybe you have an opinion about this. I'm almost offended as a reader, because I think of myself as a pretty voracious reader, and I am almost offended with people that are like, oh, yeah, no, I listen to three books a week. I'm like, mm, that's not the same. <laughs> I hate that, too. <laughs> okay, good. It's not just me. It's Nick. Come on. As an author, if someone says, I listen to Corey Burrell read your book, do you feel the same? Like, it's the same. That's great. You count that person as a reader. the same as someone that sits down and turns the pages. Yeah, well, um, you put me on the spot here, John. <laughs> don't alienate okay. the listeners. You don't have to answer it. You don't have to answer it. I think your long pause told us all we need to know, right, ladies? That's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Say anything, but I've said Stop alienating the listeners, Jocelyn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, you know, a road trip is one thing, but like, you know, listening to it on the bus on your way to work. I know. I just don't get it. Anyways. Okay. No, we don't have to. That, we can save that for another time. <laughs> but thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that you took the time to talk to us. I love the book. I'm really looking forward to your next book. And I'm looking forward to you looking up your books I haven't read. No, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Really. It's, it's totally been my pleasure. Well, Nick, yeah. um, just before we close out, um, if you want to give any links to your social media, uh, now is the time. Um, you can, anyone who's interested, they can go to, I think it's www.thetroopbook.com and, uh, you just, there's some, some stuff. I've got a blog there and, uh, yeah, you can check that out. Awesome. And you're also on Goodreads as well that I yes, saw. Yes, I so am. That's right. You can add Nick Cutter on Goodreads. You can find, your book is on Amazon, I'm guessing. Yep. Perfect. Please find it on Amazon to pick it up and actually read it. <laughs> All right, um, and on, if someone wanted Thank to, you, I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and yeah, if someone wanted to uh, to find you on Nick, Twitter, I'm sending you a, I'm sending you a Goodreads friend invite because I think we're probably going to like some of the same stuff. Sweet. <laughs> and if we wanted to find you on Twitter, where would we find you? Uh, what am I? I'm at, at, at the Nick Cutter. Perfect. All right. Do you so... tweet at all under your actual name, or do you just are you just sticking with the Nick Cutter thing? Just the Nick Cutter, yeah. I never, I never opened one up under under my own name, but I'll just do all my all my all purpose tweeting under Nick Cutter. Okay. Perfect okay. for all horror related novel tweets. The Nick Cutter on Twitter. That's right. Excellent. All right, so Jocelyn, do you want to give your Twitter handle so people can find you? Sure. I am at J B Rivard, J B R I V A R D. Perfect. And Lisa, your turn. Uh, I'm at L-C-F-R-E-M-O-N-T. Excellent. So you can find the Horror Honeys podcast on Podomatic, on Stitcher, on Radio Fubar on Sunday nights. And you can also find us on the Wicked Radio Network, of which we are a very proud member. Um, thank you once again to our sponsors, Bean Nectar Meadery and Scandal Brewing. We couldn't do this without you guys. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. We hope to have you listen to us again soon. <laughs> hey, everybody, ready to say goodbye? <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>
I love to take my baby to a movie show So I can try to smooch her while the lights are low But you will curdle do a story of romance There's only one way I've got a chance It takes the Batman, Wolfman, Frankenstein or Dracula To put her in the mood for love It takes the cat girl, dog boy, creature from the Black Lagoon 